Kids Church, released. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. I'll meet you there in a moment. Galatians chapter 5. Hopefully you've had your bookmark just stayed kept there. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 16, says this, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. But if you're led by the Spirit, uh, I'm sorry, hold on, we we just totally missed that. But I say, uh, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But now the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. This is God's Word. Let me pray for you. Father God, we thank you so much for a new day. God, you're so gracious to us. Another day to exist, another day to live, another day to live for your glory. How generous and kind you are, God. We rejoice in who you are today. And Father, I pray now at the preaching of your word, your people would be fed and that you would be glorified. We ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it is good to be with you today as we've been waking our way through uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, Wednesday night, if you were here, we talked about gentleness. Today, my assignment is self-control. You say, but what about patience? Well, guess what? Be patient. That's the last fruit, uh, and Dad will be covering that next week. So, ha-ha, we're going to make you practice the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, anyways, um, so here's what I want you to do this morning. Uh, If you're near somebody, um, in just a second, I want you to look them directly in the eye, and they will do the same to you, or you can look up at me if you're flying solo today, and... um, We're going to practice some self-control. I'm going to read off some really terrible dad jokes. And as you're looking eye to eye with that person next to you, I want you to try your best not to laugh. Okay? Here we go. So look at your neighbor or somebody near you or just look up at me. Lock it in. Serious face. Here we go. Here we go. Ready? Where would you find flying rabbits in the Hair Force? Some of y'all out already on that one? Wow, okay. What do you call pastors in Germany? German shepherds. Did you hear about the superhero with the lisp who always works out? He's Thor. Come on now. Uh, What do you call a jacket that goes up in flames? A blazer. What do you call someone who gets mad when they don't have any bread? Lactose intolerant. What is Starbucks' favorite city? Fort Lauderdale. Why wasn't Jesus allowed in the jewelry shops of Jerusalem? They were afraid he was going to break every chain. Okay, all right. Enough of that. I hope you practice some self-control. That is a, a silly test of self-control, but the topic itself is worth a serious look. Galatians 5 tells us, as Christians, we can and should be desiring the fruit of the Spirit, right? We would say it like this. We should desire for the character of Jesus to be evident in our life. And the very last item listed in Galatians 5 is self-control. That's our focus this morning. I've titled the message today, Seeking Self-Control Between God and My Phone. Because we're going to be examining how we interact with this 
oh-so-present piece of technology and how that relates to self-control. We're going to see three truths that we must keep in our hearts in the text today. Number one, we discern or learn the primacy, the importance of self-control. Number two, we want to diagnose the problem of self-control. And finally, we want to discover the path to self-control. And if you've heard me uh, preach before, I try to give you questions to consider, um, to think broadly about a topic or a doctrine or whatever I'm preaching on that that day, Um, because I trust the Holy Spirit to to convict and guide where where he where he where we need to change. But today we're going to be a different focus. We're going to be applying this truth of self control, laser like, to one area of our life, and it's our phone. And I study, as I studied the fruit of self-control, I felt led for this message to have a narrow focus, a laser-like focus on this ubiquitous piece of technology and that we interact with all the time. Now, I want to give you some caveats right off the bat. Here we go. Caveats. This is not me looking down on you saying, be better with your phones. Not it at all. Trust me, I am stepping on my own toes as I prepared this message, um, this is not me saying phones are the devil. That's not it at all. And I'm not saying you or your team shouldn't own or use a phone. Okay, I just want to get those out of the way right up front. I am preaching to myself as much as anybody. So this is me first and you as well. And so what I am saying though is that phones can be an area of where we neglect the fruit of self-control. So the goal for today, here's the goal, ready? I am calling, folks, that's a phone pun. I am calling for a time of evaluation and planning for how you can glorify God, grow in self-control, and establish healthier habits with your phone. I'll give you a content recommendation as well. Song called Surrender by the band Bright Shelter would be a good song to uh, listen to as you think about the truths uh, that we're gonna get into today. So let's get into it. How do we seek self-control? Number one, you discern the primacy, the importance of self-control. From Galatians 5, we know that self-control obviously is part of the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, for the Christian, self-control is an area of life where to be constantly growing to be more like Christ. It's actually a topic that shows up multiple times in Scripture. And so what we're going to do today... Uh, is we're going to look at three specific verses from the book of Proverbs to guide us in our thought process about uh, self-control. And let's just start here. When we talk about the primacy, the importance that the Bible puts on it, let's start right here, Proverbs 16.32. It says this, Better a patient person than a warrior, one with self-control, than one who takes a city. The New King James Version, I like the way it says it as well. It says this, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Now just think about that for a moment. Think about what that verse is saying. This is written in ancient times, right? Where the warriors among your city or tribe or village We're the most vital people around, right? The warriors of your city determine whether you were free or enslaved or taken captive. A warrior who knew how to plan and attack another city and take it out. Man, if you had that guy on your squad, you were good. They were the most important people around. And yet, God's word right here tells us the primacy, the importance of self-control in a way that would shock the people of Israel when they heard this, when they read the book of Proverbs. God says a person with self-control is better, more impactful than a champion warrior who knows how to take out a rival city. That's incredible. The word the Bible uses for self-control is this word agratia. It means an inward strength that displays itself in outward control over oneself. I put it in my own words. This is my own definition. Take it or leave it. But my definition of self-control is 
the lordship of Jesus displayed in my life, his word over my desires. Lordship means that Jesus takes that space of ultimate authority, ultimate control. It's not me and, 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 and Jesus right there. No, I, I'm not the co-pilot. There's a, there's a Lord of my life, and it's not me. So he is top. He's above. He's ultimate when it comes to phone and technology decisions. His word over my desires. So self-control begins with the gospel, right? Lordship implies surrender. You won't start self-control until you surrender. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, You were bought with the price Therefore, honor God with your bodies. You were bought with a price. In other words, you, you were a sinner. You were a rebel against God. You were undeserving of salvation and grace. You owed a debt you could never pay. And Jesus gave himself in your place to pay your debt. That's what we sang this morning. Well, I didn't know this song was going to be on there, but Jesus paid it all. So guess what? I'm not my own. I don't have full say over all the decisions of my life. But here's the tension you feel, right? The culture you walk around in every day does not care. <laughs> it does not care about self-control. The world says it like this. The phone is yours. So you should do exactly what you want with it. And that's what the world is going to encourage you to do. The world does not value self-control. The world does not care about self-control, especially in regards to phone usage. In fact, they study human behavior and how to lower your self-control and get you addicted to these things. They don't care about it. They want the opposite of it. But God is telling us, God is telling us a person with self-control is mightier, more impactful than a warrior who can conquer a city. Titus 2, 11 and 12, again, reminds us of the importance. Look at what it says. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live, how? Self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Growing up as a kid in the 80s and 90s, I, to be honest with you, um, I watched wrestling um, as a kid, not ashamed of that. Um, and uh, there was one of my favorites was a guy called the Ultimate Warrior. Uh, anybody, amen? Okay, all right, yeah, thank you. Some of y'all, all right. What a great name, right? But his costume was so cool, like all the neon and all this stuff. And the Ultimate Warrior was amazing. And um, he, most wrestlers, when their music comes on, they would like walk out and like, oh, hear the crowd and kind of slowly make their way down. Ultimate Warrior would sprint out when his music came. That's him running out when his music came on. It was awesome. WrestleMania 6, you can go back and look it up later. He beats, the, he beats Hulk Hogan for the first time. But listen, two years later at WrestleMania 8, one of the great moments of WrestleMania history, you can look it up later, he comes out of nowhere to save Hulk Hogan. <sighs> Promised myself I wouldn't cry. Ugh. It was an epic moment. I thought that's what an ultimate warrior looked like, right? The strength, the outward bravado. God shows me how wrong I am. The man who used to let alcohol dominate his life, but now he gives it up so he can serve his wife and his kids, guess what? That's stronger. The woman who used to be addicted to what other people thought, but now she finds her identity in Christ, guess what? That's stronger. The man or the woman who refuses to look at the filth that's on the internet, that's stronger. Better is one with self-control than an ultimate warrior. We say it this way. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Those who walk in it glorify God and love others well. Let it bloom in you. Some questions to consider here. Have I been valuing and pursuing self-control? Do I currently make decisions regarding my phone based on my feelings, emotions, desires, and what I feel like doing? 
Or is my phone usage displaying the lordship of Jesus in my life? And third here, where am I easily saying yes to ungodliness and worldly passions with my phone? Self-control isn't a minor thing. It's not just something that, oh, hey, maybe you should get to this one day. No, God says it's important. It's available as part of the fruit of the Spirit. It gives us a strength and a mightiness that's greater than the most fierce warrior alive. So first, you discern the primacy of self-control. Second, you diagnose the problem of self-control. Our second verse from Proverbs is Proverbs 25, verse 28. You'll see it up here. It says this, like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Another city metaphor, right? And now the picture becomes clearer. The person with self-control, that's mightier than a warrior who knows how to take out a city. But now here it's saying the person without self-control, it's like a city whose walls are broken through in a key spot. Somebody without self-control is like a city with a clear weakness in their defense system. Think of this room as like an ancient city, right? And, And our north wall is really strong. Our west wall, our east wall, they're strong, they're mighty. But man, to the south, that back wall, there's a big gap in that. It's been broken down. If an enemy is approaching, where are they going to go? Are they going to try to fight through the strong areas? Or are they going to attack the spot that's weak? So it is with our enemy. We could say it like this. An enemy force doesn't need the entire wall broken down to conquer a city. Just a place that's broken through. Likewise, your enemy seeks one weak spot of self-control where he can attack and tempt you. So diagnose and prepare accordingly. And I would say for many teenagers and adults in our time, the phone is that area of broken down wall. Here's some research, and I'll just tell you this, this is the very tip of the iceberg. If you want to research the effects of phones that we're just now discovering, man, there's a lot out there. I'm going to give you just a piece. Uh, A really interesting professor named Jean Twinge, uh, I've read many of her books. She's got a lot of interesting research out there. She is not Christian, uh, to my knowledge, uh, but I've been fascinated with a lot of what she's put out there. She's written several books. I've read them as well. Um, But they surveyed, she surveyed over a a half a million teenagers across the country. And they started to see uh, some really interesting trends between the years 2010 and 2015. And by the way, these trends have only increased since 2015. Well, what did they notice among teenagers? The number of U.S. teens who felt useless and joyless surged 33%. Teen suicide attempts increased 23%. Teens who actually committed suicide increased 31%. And they noticed this went across all lines. In other words, from every background, this affected all teenagers. It wasn't just the rich or the poor or the white or the black. It was across all cultural, socioeconomic lines. I'll give you some graphs here. They they noticed as well the number of teens who were likely to get enough sleep, uh, less likely to get enough sleep, jumps right around 2012, 2015. The number of teens who were more likely to feel lonely continues to climb. You see around 2007, 2008, and it just starts to skyrocket, and again, it's only gone up since then. Teens dealing with depression around 2012, it starts to skyrocket. The red is teenage girls, the blue is teenage boys. And again, it's only gone up from there. The Pew Research Center added some data, and this is what they found. Well, why is it that around that that gap, that that 2010 to 2015, what was happening there? Well, the iPhone was, was out by... 2012, phone ownership among teenagers passed the 50% threshold mark. That's right when you see those, ga- those graphs start to really take off. By 2015, 73% of teenagers had phones, and I would say probably today it's in the 90s. 
And the general trend is the more time on their phones, the more damaging and destructive it became. But I want to tell you this, it's not limited to teenagers. What do we see? And you can find this on multiple different things. The, the, the number I was uh, coming back to time and again, it's estimated that phone usage or addiction or issues, the phone is the leading cause in around 30% of divorce. And again, that number's climbing. It could be a major point of conflict in marriages. It is extremely fertile ground for things like porn addiction, inappropriate relationships, massive coveting, jealousy, gossip, arguments, poor financial decisions, on and on down the road. The smartphone has a technology. It's really interesting. Man, it can bring a lot of good to our lives, but I think we're just starting to realize how much damage it's done to people's lives too. It truly is for many people, teenagers and adults, that spot where, man, the wall is broken through and the enemy is getting in. One pastor, Tim Keller, he says it like this. He says, if you can't control your appetite for food, you will ruin your body. If you can't control your tongue or temper, you will say things that can't be unsaid or taken back. If you can't control your sexual desires, you will ruin relationships. If you are impulsive and imprudent, you will make rash decisions. He says the wall just needs to be broken down at one point to let the enemy in. So a lack of self-control, even in just one area of life, is a life-threatening problem. So let's think about this. I made a list here. You could probably add a lot of things on here. What would be some warning signs, some yellow or red flags that we need to pay attention to that, man, maybe the phone is a place where our wall is broken down or our teenager's wall is broken down. What are some warning signs? Oh, they just spend hours and hours each day online. The constant feeling of, man, I got to check it, right? New updates, new content, likes, shares, whatever. Constantly finding yourself comparing your life to others. Envy is the silent but massive sin of the internet, Unable to go without your phone for even short periods of time. Engaging in sinful behavior, porn or questionable content, gossip, bullying. Engaging in secretive sinful behavior. A private account, a hidden account, hiding information and or relationships from your parents, from your spouse, from others. No accountability from parents or your spouse or Christian friends on your usage and activities, and anger, anger when you actually do encounter limits. There's more, again, you could probably add to that. Those are just some that I would say, man, those are, those are some warning signs that we need to pay attention here. We have to be honest with where our wall is broken down because that's where we have the greatest potential to be broken by sin. Michael Phelps, one of the most successful Olympic athletes in history. Yeah, he's has several gold medals. When he's training for the Olympics, when he was training, he would swim uh, 80,000 meters per week. You say, Josh, I don't speak meters. What is that? Okay, I got you. 50 miles. 50 miles per week of just this in water. 50 miles a week. He would also do uh, weightlifting and body weight workouts, his self control is legendary. That much swimming every day. I guess he gets a real kick out of swimming. You know, this is actually, he set a lot of speed records. One time, the police came up to the pool where he was swimming, and he was going so fast, they asked him to pull over. You know what? Swimming puns are dangerous. I better not dive into any more. Okay, stop. What did he do? He stayed dedicated to finding any weakness, any weakness in his stroke. Man, he was hour after hour after hour after hour perfecting it, finding the weakness and eliminating it. What if we took the same approach to self-control in our own life? What if we put that type of emphasis on self-control with how we use our phone? But guess what? 1 Corinthians 9 Paul says that's exactly what we should do. He says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, 
or swim, but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games, the Olympics, exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. He says, therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body, make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Paul says, look at those great athletes. Think about that. Their level of self-control with their physical bodies and their craft, whatever they're doing, man, that should be us in our spiritual lives. So we can say it this way, be diligent to honestly diagnose the problem of self-control in your own life. Knowing where your walls are broken brings a clarity for how to move forward. Some questions to consider here. One, has my phone usage been more of a place for spiritual breakthroughs or for the enemy to break through my walls? What patterns can I see in my own life looking backward? Secondly, as an Olympic athlete would diligently diagnose any weakness in their life and training, how can I assess my self-control with my phone? And who else can assist me here? And parents, you could be part of this with your own children. So that leads us to the question then, how do we fix those broken spots in the wall? I'm glad you asked. First, you discern the primacy of self-control. You then diagnose the problem of self-control. And finally, you drive the path to self-control. The solution is not, you must try harder. That's not it. Our last verb, our last verse from Proverbs, it's Proverbs 18, 10, and 11. It says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs unto it and is safe. A rich man's wealth is his strong city and like a high wall in his own imagination. First, notice again, we're given the imagery of an ancient city. The rich man, he thinks that his wealth is his strong wall. The rich man thinks, man, if I've got my wealth, then that's, that's my wall, that's my security. But it says it's only in its mind. It's only in his mind. It's his imagination. It's an illusion. In other words, it's saying for him, wealth, he thinks it's his wall, but it's, 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 it's an illusion. We could say it this way. Everyone has something that makes you say, if I have that, I'll be safe, I'll be secure, I'll be happy. And the truth is, whatever that is, That is your place of ultimate security. And for some of you, for some of us, it's your phone. That's why it's so hard to go without it. Because like the rich man thinking his wealth is a strong wall, for some of us, it's the phone. If I have that, man, I'm good. I'm safe. I'm comfortable. And that's why when you encounter any accountability or or barriers about it, you get angry. Why? Because your, your safe place has been threatened. Your city walls, your place of security is being threatened. But here's the contrast the verse gives us. It says the righteous runs to the name of the Lord. There it is. For the righteous man, notice this, God is is not just a strong city. God's not even a high wall. God's something so much better. He's a strong tower. Think about the progression here, right? A strong city, if you have that, boy, a strong city, that's pretty good. A, A strong city with good walls, Man, that's even better. But guess what's the best? A strong tower, impenetrable. And that's what God is for his people. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run to it. They don't walk to it, they run. Not wealth, not a phone, not a screen, but the Lord. So let's say it this way. You begin to drive the path of self-control when you run to the name of the Lord. When he is your place of security, the fruit of self-control will grow. So what does that mean? How do we run to the name of the Lord? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, we'll get to it here. Another pastor says it this way. It says, God's name is a way of speaking of his nature and attributes. It says so it this way. To, to run unto God's name is to deliberately rehearse and repeat and tell yourself who he is. 
That's where self-control begins, when you run to the name of the Lord. I'll give you several ways that I like to do this. Number one is scripture memorization. I think it's one of the best ways to remind yourself of who God is, what he's done, what he's really like. Put the word of God in your heart and mind, and you can do it. And it's good for you, young and old. It's good for you. Put the word in your heart. Secondly, reading books about him. The Bible, of course, and then other materials. Reading, focusing your mind on the truth of God. It's reminding yourself. It's running to the name of the Lord. Music walks outside. I shared with you when we did kindness, how I do my Sunday morning routine. A lot of y'all been asking. Um, I talk about that. I, I begin my Sunday morning with a walk before we ever get to church, right? It's to help me focus and run to the name of the Lord. And then focused prayer. Focused prayer. Uh, This is not like chanting a certain thing, um, it's not that kind of thing, but a focused prayer. I'll share with you one that I found that I really like. It's very simple. I didn't write this, I didn't come up with this, it's just something I've found that helps me run to the name of the Lord. It's four parts. It says it like this. One, there is nothing I have done that could make you love me less, and nothing I have done that would make you love me more. That's true with me and God. Two, you are all I need for everlasting joy. Three, as you have been to me, so I will be toward others. And four, as I pray, I'll do so according to the compassion you showed me at the cross and the power you demonstrated through your resurrection. Man, when I encounter just simple truth, that's something that helps me run to the name of the Lord. That's a way for me to rehearse and repeat and remind myself of who God is and what he's really like. And there's other ways, but man, whatever it is for you, let's say it this way, whatever helps you run to God, do that instead of more time on your phone. Pursue it. All right, so I'm going to give you some disciplines. Again, this is just a list I came up with. This is not definitive. You could add your own, but just some disciplines to think about for you, your teenager, your family, whatever it is, some disciplines for you to consider on how you use your phone. I'll give you my list. Again, you can add to it. Number one, it's very simple. Develop your own route to the strong tower. I gave you some of mine. I gave you five different things, that prayer, all the stuff I talked about, but you, develop your own. What's going to be my path to run to the strong tower? (laughs) Number two, involve others. Involve others. Set scheduled check-ins. Hey, I want you to help me grow in self-control with how I use my phone. Will you contact me? Will you check with me? Get people getting up in your business. Number three, (laughs) embrace barriers, filters, blockers, accountability apps, whatever it is for you. (laughs) Build high walls in front of temptations. Make it hard to get to the stuff you struggle with on technology. Create times of distance and drought. Distance and drought. Distance, that means physically being distant from your phone, right? At mealtime. When we do our family meals on Tuesdays and Sunday nights, I want my phone to be away during those times right? Physical distance. At nighttime, this is something I'm trying to be better at, not getting in bed with the phone and looking at stupid memes and funny stuff, right? It's a time waster. I'm trying to get better at that, putting distance. But then also times of drought, right? Where there's fasting from it. Actually not using your phone for a day. Woo! No access to it to reset your mind and heart. Times of distance, times of drought. It's a discipline to consider. Third, or whatever number we're on. I didn't number these. Pursue real life activities with others. Right? Be around other people. Real life activities. One of my favorite things, if you know me, you know me. Board games. Right? I love to be where we interact and we don't have our phones out and we're hanging out. Right? Um, At our house, I call it attention pollution. If someone pulls their phone out while we're playing games, I'll start fake coughing. Oh, oh, oh. climate change, oh, whatever. (laughs) 
right? Attention pollution, man, we keep that away. It's, it's a fun time where we're actually looking at each other and laughing and having a good time. Yeah, that's for me, I love that. But what, it, what is it for you? Maybe you can write songs. Maybe you like to paint or draw. Whatever it is, pursue real life activities. And then I would say find outdoor activities. Think God made us to be outdoors. And here's one, watch this, serve others. You want to grow in self-control, be a servant. Die to yourself and say, you know what, I want to serve others. I want to be a blessing to somebody. See what that does to your self-control. Helpful questions. Usually I give you two or three. I'm going to give you several here. And again, I, these are questions I'm asking myself first and foremost. Some questions to consider here. Is it wise and helpful for me or my team to have a phone right now? Secondly, how can I embrace repentance, changing direction with my phone? What are three or four changes I can commit to right now that will help with my spiritual growth and health? Who else will know about my commitments? Who else can give me honest, insightful feedback about my phone usage? Here's one. What apps or platforms do I need to take a break from? What apps or platforms do I need to leave completely? Or message threads, whatever it is. And then simply this one. What can I eliminate to free up more time away from my phone? None of those is a magic pill. All the disciplines I just listed, all the questions, none of that's a magic pill. I'm just putting some things out there for you to think about so that we can walk in pursuit of the fruit of the Spirit growing in us. The goal, like we said at the beginning, was to call you to evaluate, to plan for how you can grow in self-control with how you use this technology. Three things Scripture encourages us to begin right now. One, that you would discern the primacy of self-control. That you would be diligent to diagnose the problem of self-control. And then finally, that you would drive the path to self-control. That you would run to the name of the Lord. Well, as we draw near to the end of the time in our Fruit of the Spirit study, I want to invite you. You're invited to a coffin. To a coffin. That's where you're invited. Look again at Galatians verse 22, five, uh, chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Look at these words. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. <laughs> Against such there is no law. That's amazing. Now look at the next two verses. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. There's a death. There's a coffin. They have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Right after all this talk of fruit growing, there's a coffin. The fruit of the Spirit, for that to grow in us, Guess what? we got to crucify the old ways. We, we must kill the old sin nature, the old ways, the ways we used to do it. It's got to die. And guess what? That's where the, the fruit of the Spirit will start to bloom. We say goodbye to our old ways. And we say hello to the fruit of the Spirit in us. This idea is expressed very beautifully in a song by an artist named John Foreman. I'll give you a bonus content recommendation right here at the end. You can look this up later, guess what, on your phone. And you can listen to this. The song is called My Coffin, off the album Shadows, and we'll close with the lyrics from this song. He says it this way. Resurrection comes, but death comes first. All of our entitlements and rights drive the hearse. Through maker's death, death is unmade. And when I lose myself, I'm safe in my coffin. Let me pray for you. Father God, we pray for the lordship of Jesus displayed in our lives. We pray, God, for your word over our desires. And Lord, I confess, and I just 
we as a people confess that, man, we, this may be an area we've, we've neglected for, for far too long. And yes, technology can be a good thing, but Lord, help it not be a God thing in our life. A lowercase g, God thing. Let it not be the most important, the most sacred thing in our hearts and minds. But God, I pray we'd be a people who run to the name of the Lord. Father, I pray for families in here today. Lord, as they think about these decisions and with their, with their kids and with their spouses, Lord, would you bring your wisdom? Would you help us to see the truth and guide us into the things we need to change? Lord, I pray for the teenagers in here. Lord, that I can't even imagine having a phone in my teenage years. I would have been a mess. I already was a mess, but I would have been more of a mess. But God, I pray you'd bring wisdom to their hearts. And Father, help us to lead well and to, to be people who seek to honor you in every area of our life, especially the way we handle technology. God, would you lead us and guide us. Help us to grow to be more like Jesus and less like our old selves. Help us to be comfortable in that coffin, to let our old ways die so that the fruit of the Spirit might grow in us. We love you, Lord. Hear us now as we sing to you. In your name we pray.